Hi, this is Phil. In this session I'd like to reflect with you on uh, what I've called the message of the Song of Solomon. Now of course that's a bit of an ambitious title because there's much we can learn from the Song of Solomon. But I'd like to reflect with you on uh, what we could call the the message being sexuality redeemed. What is interesting is that there's a comparison when we think of the broad tenor of scripture, there's a comparison between the garden nature focus of the song with its focus on plants and animals and trees and flowers, birds, spices, this kind of thing. And the garden motif we find at the very beginning in Genesis chapters 1 and chapters 2. And uh, in Genesis we see both the creation of human sexuality and we see its distortion. Now I want to suggest to you that in the Song of Solomon we have an indication of the redemption of this really important dimension of our humanity. Okay. In Genesis 1 to 2, we have two complementary accounts of creation, as you will remember. The first, in chapter 1, on the sixth day, we see God creating humanity in the person of Adam and Eve. And humanity in the person of Adam and Eve are given dominion over creation. Notice how it's male and female that are made in the image of God. And both together are given dominion or stewardship, perhaps we should say, of creation. And then in chapter 1, verse 28, we have what I believe is the very first commandment from God to Adam and Eve, and that is that they should have sex. That is procreation. They should be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the focus here is that God gave sex for procreation, uh, for babies. Something which is downplayed today because of the uh, big focus on the pleasure of sex. Uh, this is and, and then the focus of abortion, contraception, etc, etc. But it's important that we don't ever lose sight of the fact that God gave sex for procreation so that uh, children would be born. And one of the things we read about in the Psalms is that God desires godly offspring. And notice at the end how God saw everything he had made and it was very good. In other words, all that he had made was good, including human sexuality. There's nothing impure about our sexuality, our bodies, our sexual organs, etc. All created by a good and loving God. The second creation account in chapter 2, we read how God says of Adam it was not good that he should be alone. Verse 18. Now, technically, of course, Adam was not alone in this story. He had God, who he would spend time with, and he had the animals around him. But that was not enough. He had God, his superior, and animals, his inferior. And the result was, actually, he was still lonely. Because there was no partner, no helper to be found as his partner. And so God's answer was to create a partner and we read in this marvellous story that God took a rib from Adam and we could ask why this picture of a rib and I'm sure there's many answers but it does suggest firstly that this partner that was being created and Adam were to be intimately connected 
it would suggest that there was to be equality between them. The rib comes from the side, not the head or the foot. And the other thing we read is that they were both naked and they were not ashamed. There was nothing about their sexuality that brought shame. So here we get a picture of uh, they, how they expressed their sexuality. Uh, it was with complete intimacy and total vulnerability. And I would suggest to you that that is what this picture of being naked and unashamed represented. Uh, we read that Adam was to leave father and mother and they were to become one flesh. And here we see no indication of uh, procreation, sex being for babies, but rather sex for pleasure, for connectedness, for intimacy, for being a glue that connects this very first married couple that we have here in the Bible. And then as we go into chapter 3, you'll be aware we have an account of the fall of man. This is where humanity in the person of Adam and Eve chose to rebel against the Lordship of God. To choose for themselves what's right and wrong. With all of the tra tragic consequences that came from that in their own person, in their relationship and in the world around them. And what went wrong? Well, there were many consequences to the fall, as you will know. But one of the consequences was their sexuality got distorted. And we see immediately there's friction between Adam and Eve. Adam accusing Eve, and indeed accusing God too. Uh, but with this breakdown, they recognized they were naked where, where before there was no shame. Now there was shame, embarrassment, and they sewed fig leaves together, we saw, we read, and covered themselves. And then we see a curse on their relationship in chapter 3. And I draw your attention to chapter 3, verse 16. The second part of that verse, well, let's read it all. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And this phrase, he shall rule over you, there's been two suggestions. The first is that the woman will a desire a man, desire a husband, uh, but the man will dominate and exploit the woman, exploit his wife. And sadly we see far too many instances of that in our nations and in the world today. Some have suggested that the phrase your desire, the word desire, is connected to chapter 4 verse 7, where God speaking with Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. In other words, sin was seeking to control, dominate, and Cain was challenged to master it. And some have suggested that this word, desire, in chapter 3 should be understood in the same way and this will bring us to what we could perhaps call the battle of the sexes of the uh, control and manipulation that is often uh, used by a woman and, and indeed using her sexuality to entrap, slave, manipulate a man uh, both ways, uh, maybe, maybe both are are meant but certainly both are true in our world today and this of course is a distortion of God's purpose for human sexuality. In God's grace you will remember he clothed them, killed an animal, made clothes 
and they were covered. As we continue to read Genesis, you'll remember how we continue to see how sexuality is distorted. In chapter 419 of Genesis, Lamech took two wives, the first account of polygamy. And if you read that account, you'll see what a bully he was. In chapter 6, 1 to 7, we have some form of sexual fallenness here. And uh, there's discussion as to what exactly it is. But uh, certainly it is a distorted, perverted form of sexuality. Genesis 9 through 10, we have an, uh, 9.20, we have an account of Noah. And you'll remember how his son Ham uh, looked on his nakedness and spoke about that. And then, of course, Genesis 19, the perversion of sexuality in the sins of Sodom. Genesis 34, we have the rape of uh, Dinah and the consequences of that for the sons of Jacob. And then Judah, who had sex with his daughter-in-law Tamar, thinking she was a prostitute. And then the seduction, the attempted seduction by Potiphar's wife of Joseph. He gladly and wonderfully ran away. But we have this all the way through the book of Genesis. When we come to the song, the Song of Solomon, we have what I would suggest to you is what we could call sexuality redeemed. The Song of Solomon is a reflection on creation sexuality because we have a man and a woman again in a garden setting. They're naked and they're unashamed. Uh, we see this particularly in chapter 4.1 through 5.1. And we see uh, what we could call a healing of intimacy and sexuality. Clearly, from the story of the poems, we see that their relationship is egalitarian, it's equal. There's no manipulation, no power play, no domination, no exploitation of one over the other. Interestingly enough, Solomon, the word Solomon means peaceful. And the bride is from Shulam, a, a Shulamite, from the village of Shulam. And Shulam means peaceful. It is from the same Hebrew root as Solomon. So we could say that the song are poems about Mr. and Mrs. Peaceful. A wonderful illustration of a relationship based on a mutual serving and genuine love and care. As you read the song, you see how each is serving the needs of the other. It's about giving and not receiving. And I would suggest that this is one of the keys when it comes to the understanding of sexuality and the use of sexuality today. When we think of the abuse of sex, when we think of the tragedy of the sex slave trade and prostitution and the pornography trade, when we think of uh, people sleeping together one night stands or cohabiting, when we think of adultery and marriage breakdown, I would suggest that uh, under this is the the abuse of sex, the selfishness of sex, whereby it is about people being committed to their own needs and taking and not giving in this area. But as we read the Song of Solomon, there's that element of realism 
even though we see sexuality redeemed. We see uh, this married couple with a deeply committed covenant of love between them, enjoying unashamed sex in their relationship. We're still warned to beware of the little foxes. And we have this incident in chapter 5, two following, where the bride was too slow in responding to the advances of her husband. But when a relationship is broken, it can be healed. And that's certainly what we see in chapter 6, 7 and 8 following this incident. And so in this particular uh, understanding of the Song of Solomon, it takes the focus on the garden and sees it in relationship to these early chapters of Genesis. And there's a wonderful proclamation that sexuality, our sexuality, can be redeemed.